Episteme, derived from the Greek word for knowledge or understanding. Ology, the study of. Epistemology, the study of knowledge. Not the study of things that are known, no, the study of knowledge itself. Epistemological questions include questions like, what is knowledge? How do I know I know something? How do I know something is true? What counts as knowledge? What are the specific conditions of knowledge? And are there even limits to what we can know? All these sorts of questions fall within the philosophical purview of epistemology, and it's going to be the goal of the next few videos to give you an introductory look at different conceptual landmarks in such a domain. Now, what do I mean by this? What do I mean by conceptual landmarks? Well, let me explain. Epistemology is a large domain. So imagine a map, like a world map, a world map of philosophy. And imagine Russia, you know, like on the normal map, and just call that place epistemology. It's huge. Now, I'm going to act as a tour guide. We obviously aren't going to, you know, visit the back streets. We aren't going to visit the homes of epistemology citizens. We aren't going to visit all the local hole in the walls. You're going to have to travel around yourself to see more of the region's underbelly, but I'm not taking you there in these videos. Again, that's for you to do on your personal travels. My task is to be a tour guide where I show you all the main attractions, the significant historical locations, the main streets, the fancy buildings, and even with this limited scope, and trying to be as honest as I can, I won't even be able to show you all of those things. There just really isn't enough time. But I can do my best to help you appreciate the locations we do stop at. So that's what we're going to be doing. So our first stop is going to be the realm of the basics. And we're going to start with that big question. What is knowledge? So first things first, let's not pretend we don't know what we're talking about when we say the word no or, you know, like as in to know something. You know, we use the word all the time. You might say you know that you were born on such and such a date. You may say that you know how to ride a bike or drive a car. Some of you may say you know how to do math. So there are all sorts of modes of knowing, but the kind of knowledge philosophers since Socrates have primarily been concerned with in epistemology is what's known as knowledge that. Knowledge that something is the case. Now, it's in contrast with knowing how, as in knowing how to ride a bike or how to swim. Um, one may understand um, this in different kinds of ways, and one way of understanding it is knowledge that is knowing a proposition. A proposition, well, what is that? It's a sentence that is capable of being true or false. So, for example... Shut the door is not a proposition. Sit down is also not a proposition. It will rain tomorrow is a proposition. And so is the capital of California, Sacramento. Why? Because they all can be true. Those things can be true. Telling someone to sit down cannot be true. It's not obvious how knowing how to swim can be spelled out in terms of propositions. Um, though some philosophers think it is theoretically possible to do so, but others maintain that even if it were possible, knowing how doesn't require a complete laundry list of propositions. But that's a discussion for another time. What is important is to understand knowledge claims um, in the form of propositions, as in uh, Mandarin is spoken in Chinese as a proposition. Um, it's, it is that way of talking about propositions is the dominant mode of expression. Now, with these limited modes of knowing in mind, think to yourself, what needs to be the case for you to know any of those sorts of things? If you were to say, I know that my birthday is on such and such a date, what needs to be true in order for you to actually know your birthday is on such and such a date? Well, philosophers have been talking about this for a long time, and one very early and very ancient account of knowledge is called the JTB account. Obviously, it's an acronym, but we're going to be talking about this account right now. So what about your birthday? What needs to be the case for you to know it? 
Well, one thing seems obvious. You have to believe it. If you're going to know it, you're going to have to believe it too. So it seems belief is a necessary condition for knowledge. This is the B part of the JTB account of knowledge. Now, it should be obvious that believing something is not sufficient for knowledge. This means that mere believing in some proposition X does not mean I automatically know X, right? So for example, I can believe there is uh, an invisible pink dinosaur wandering around my backyard, but that doesn't mean I know such an invisible pink dinosaur even exists. You know, it, again, belief is not sufficient for knowledge, but it is necessary. Any instance of knowledge is also going to have to be an instance of belief. Uh, in other words, knowledge is a subset of belief, not vice versa. Okay, so what's another stipulated condition for knowledge? If someone were to tell you they know the capital of China is London, would you think their statement, I know the capital of China is London, is true? Do they have knowledge of this alleged fact? It seems to a great many of us that the answer is obviously no. And that's because you cannot know a falsity. You can know that something is false, but you can't know something falsely. So truth is that other item in the JTB account of knowledge. It's the T, obviously. So, so far we have concluded that for something to count as knowledge, it must be at least, you know, a true belief. But we aren't done yet. But you might be thinking, well, what else is there? Surely if I believe something and it's true, then why don't I have knowledge? That certainly seems like an intuitive way of thinking about it, and it may even align with the way you use the word knowledge. In school, for example, you may have read a bunch of biology and spent a great many hours studying and memorizing your biology textbook. So wouldn't we say you know a lot about biology? Now, assuming everything you learned in the biology book is true, and you believe it, wouldn't we reasonably maintain that you know the material? It seems so. But there is something missing that perhaps even this biology example isn't making clear to us, but is still nonetheless present. So, to see what's missing, let's think about the following scenario. You feel sick, and you decide to go to the doctor. He says, I know what's wrong with you. So he gives you some medicine, and we'll call it Medicine A. You go home, and you take Medicine A, and it has no effect. You are still sick, unfortunately. So you go back to the doctor, and he says, Ah, I know what's wrong with you now. He gives Medicine B. You go home, you take it, and it still does nothing. You return. He says, don't worry, don't worry, I know. I know what's wrong with you. So he gives you medicine C. You go home, take it, uh, you take medicine C, and lo and behold, you are cured. Now, reflecting on all those times the doctor said he knew what was wrong with you and how to cure you, do you believe him? Would we want to attribute knowledge to this doctor? Now, of course, this is assuming the doctor wasn't some maniac and truly knew your condition, but he just wanted to watch you suffer. So assuming his dialogue with you is genuine, would we attribute knowledge to this doctor, knowledge of your condition? Well, for a great many people, uh, all the way since you know ancient, ancient times, uh, for a great many people, uh, they would say no. And why? Now, there are disputes about this. But a very common and influential answer to that question is the doctor was, in the end, right about what would cure you. It was, in fact, medicine C. But he was right only accidentally. He was lucky in his choice of medicine, and it was ultimately due to mere luck you were cured. So this accidentally being right is the culprit that prevents the doctor from knowing in this particular case. So philosophers have a word for that thing, which is meant to ensure believing truly is not a result of mere luck. And that word, you probably have heard of this, is justification. If our beliefs are justified, if we know how we came to our beliefs, or we have access to the way we arrived at our beliefs, if there is some rational story to be told of the origin of our beliefs, then we are said to be justified in our believing. The doctor 
had no such story. He lacked reasons for why he believed the things he did. He did not know why he believed them. He lacked evidence. He lacked reasons for his belief entirely. So the JTB account of knowledge maintains that knowledge is true, justified belief. Now, the following may seem a little advanced, but I do want to point it out. So if you don't understand everything I'm about to say, don't worry. You will eventually, because we're going to be going more in depth in later videos. But I do want to mention it here uh, near the end of this video. It's important to recognize that the role of justification is meant to ensure luck does not play the primary or sole role in producing true beliefs. It is not the role of justification to ensure luck plays no role at all. So this is a really important nuance because when we talk in the future about reliabilism, again, don't worry about knowing what this is. Um, well, I'll just tell you real quick. Uh, reliabilists think knowledge is true belief that is achieved via a reliable process. And an opponent might say that a reliable process isn't necessarily optimal, that a reliable process could produce the desired results only 80% of the time. And so if your true belief was produced out of such a reliable process, then that true belief was partly due to luck. There was a 20% chance it could have been false. So the reliable process did not guarantee truth, and so the reliabilist account of knowledge is problematic. Well, insofar as reliabilists perceive reliable processes as modes of justification, because not all of them do, uh, this critique fails to understand that justification is not meant to be an infallible a guarantor of true belief. Justification, instead, how it should be understood, or at least this is what I think, is it should be understood as something that is meant to ensure true belief is not a product of mere luck. So surely the reliable process, even if it is only successful 80% of the time, plays a necessary explanatory role in the story of how the true belief was produced. The production of the true belief cannot be primarily or solely credited to luck, like that in the case of the doctor. So, now we are done with our excursion, but I, I don't think it was entirely pointless, right? Because if, if you've been paying attention, you might be noticing something strange about what's going on here. Uh, you might be noticing a possible division of what it means for something to be justified, and you'd be right. So far, we've been talking about the JTB account of knowledge. Now, in future videos, we will learn about Edmund Gettier, who has traditionally been seen as the guy who demonstrated uh, this account of knowledge to have many problems, showing that the conditions of true justified belief could be met in certain scenarios, but yet would still fall short of knowledge. But before we talk about that guy in the future, um, I want to spend some time talking about justification. You may have noticed that when I first talked about justification, I said um, that one is justified in believing something if they have access to the things that, that justify. In other words, if you um, do not have access to the reasons that justify your true belief, then you will fall short of knowledge. That was, after all, you know why the doctor failed to know um, what was wrong with you and couldn't cure you uh, without randomness. He didn't have good reasons for his choices of medicine. He was randomly giving you medicine, and, and due to luck, you were cured. But then later, uh, I mentioned, but not in great detail, I mentioned reliabilism. But I characterized reliabilist justification as a reliable process. So if my optical processes are reliable, and I see a tree in front of me, and it is true that there's a tree in front of me, then a true belief about this tree born from this reliable process counts as knowledge. But if we think about it, do we access or do we have access to this process? Can I think just real hard and suddenly come to realize the reliability of, of my optic nerve or, or, my, or my senses? It seems this process cannot act as reasons that I'm aware of or that I can cite as for why I think there is a tree. I might be entirely ignorant of such processes. So this way of thinking about justification seems counter 
to the way we first characterized justification earlier on. Well, don't worry. In the next video, we will be diving deeper into the nature of justification and explore the distinction between internalism about justification and externalism about justification. See you then, guys.